Um, so yeah, um, so my name is Julien Lenné. I lead the team that works on extreme scale tagging phase. So we are kind of pushing um, the frontier for the next level of, uh, of open source model. Um, and actually this talk is a nice follow-up. I don't know if this one made so by the organizers uh, on the previous one, because I think the previous one was a great introduction uh, to Lama, to some of the model that exists today. And kind of the way I structure this talk is into like, what are some of the challenges uh, that we have to solve to move to the next generation? Um, which some have been calling frontier models, which is a pretty cool name, so I'm reusing it. Um, one of the, so what does this next generation look like is that if you look at current uh, language models, uh, so for instance, Flamma2, uh, you have about 70 billion parameters, trained on two trillion tokens, that's about 10,000 petaflops days, um, it's a unit of compute essentially, trained on 2,000 more or less, 100s. Um, that's the SOTA for open source, the state of the art. <laughs> for closed source, um, we are looking more like GPT-4. You know, depending on which rumor you want to trust, it's about 220 billion parameters, 13 trillion tokens. That's about 200,000 petaflops days. That's a lot. Uh, trend on 20,000 and 100 for more or less 100 days. And the model that we are going to kind of be concerned about in this presentation, like what we are kind of trying to workshop together, uh, is what will be trained in 2024. So this will be a model that will be trained on about 100 trillion tokens, um, about a few million petaflops days, and probably something like 100,000 H100. Um, this number might seem a bit crazy, but they are very real. There is actually the 110 H100 is actually being built right now somewhere in the US, and this is a massive engineering challenge to actually build a data center that can hold that many H100 and all of the power for it, mostly. It's a huge power draw, essentially. It's like on the order of 100 megawatt or more. Um, so, and kind of what has inspired this talk, you know, kind of what are the models that uh, I've personally been involved that have, impa that have inspired what I'm about to say. So there is Bloom, um, which was kind of one of the first uh, open language model. It was built more or less at the same time as OPT, which was the predecessor to Lama. Uh, and Bloom was like a multilingual, uh, kind of like open science effort. Um, and it's about the scale of GPT-3. And two other models that are built uh, over last year uh, at TII and with Lighton, the previous startup I was at, where I was a team lead for this project, uh, of which the largest was Fal Falcon 180B. Uh, it's a 180 billion parameter model, trained on 3.5 trillion tokens, and that's about 45,000 petaflops days. To put this in perspective, it's about twice Palm, but half Palm too large. I don't know if, that's, if that helps. For me, it helps. <laughs> so that's the idea. Um, what are we going to talk about is that, essentially, to scale the models, we need three things. Um, it's somewhat straightforward in, some, in a way. Uh, we have performance scalability, so this is the fact that the models get better, you know, as we, as we improve scale. We have data scalability, how much more data we are going to need to train these models. And there is hardware scalability, which is the fact that we need, you know, more and more hardware, more and more compute. And in a way, uh, all of everything about large language models revolve about scaling essentially these three things in some way and facing challenges uh, when you are scaling these three things. So the first one I'm going to talk about is performance scalability and kind of predictability as well, because this is also a quite important point. So probably you have seen this sort of plots. Uh, you know this idea is the idea of scaling laws. So essentially, as you make your models increasingly large, so it's not just increasingly large, it's as you spend increasingly more compute into the model, and that compute you can ma put into making the model larger or training for longer. Um, essentially, performance follows scaling laws. Um, and what this means is that essentially downstream, like, sorry, upstream language modeling performance improves in a predictable way as you increase compute. This is very powerful. Um, if you go to other sciences, other building at EPFL, uh, they do not have such an easy relationship of I will spend twice the money and I will get that much better of something. It's not true anywhere. It's probably only true in LLMs currently. This is crazy. Like, this is something that's like the biggest driver of progress probably uh, in what we are seeing. And what's kind of cool also is that it translates in terms of downstream performance. So of this plot, I'm giving you the MMLU five-shot performance, which is a benchmark. It's kind of arbitrary, but a lot of people report it, so it makes it very easy for me to put a lot of models on this uh, against the compute. And what you can see is that the trend is very smooth. Like, it's also a reason why people like MMLU. As we put more compute, the performance improves. And here I try to put only pre-trained models to not have like the issue of fine-tuning. But for GPT-4, I don't really have a choice because they don't report the pre-trained results. Um, and another interesting thing to see, you know, essentially the only outliers are multilingual models, so they behave somewhat differently, and that we are very close to expert rater performance. Um, and by the way, if you want to have fun one day, uh, go to the MMLU paper, try the questions. Um, 
already getting to the average router performance, even for us, who are probably, you know, like, educated in a wide range of fields that are in MMLU, is challenging. This is very hard, actually. Now, although if you go to CMMLU, you will ask yourself the question, is that really what I want to use my model for? Like, does this really align with my usage of the model? And this is one of the big challenges that we can predict very well the performance of the models, but it's very difficult to know, you know, what task we should choose to predict, what task is representative of our use case. Um, and this stems from a very fundamental issue, uh, which is that pre-training is not aligned with how we want to use our model. So during pre-training, you are essentially predicting the next word. You know, you are doing autoregressive, like you are training a causal model. Uh, so you are predicting the next word, and predominantly it's web data. You know, you might have some books thrown in there, but it's not that different. Um, and probably you will not have these books for very long due to the lawsuit. So anyway, probably we'll only have web data soon. Um, so, and you know, that doesn't exactly look like what, how we want to use the model. Because downstream, the main use case for LLM nowadays is AI assistance. You know, you open ChatGPT. You don't ask ChatGPT to complete your, ECC, your ICC filing for you. You ask ChatGPT, oh, when should I use a data class in Python? Um, and this is very different. Um, and this objective of like predicting the next word and following user's instruction are completely at odds with one another in some ways. Um, and so to you know, essentially solve that, what we do as practitioners is um, we kind of think that the knowledge is already there. I think before there was, uh, Armand raised the question, or maybe we add, although it's possible, although fine tuning adds, I think it's, it's probably a spectrum between finding what's already there, adding a bit, steering. Like, it's probably a spectrum. Um, I'm kind of framing it at steering here uh, as a simplified way. And kind of like the two main frameworks for doing this currently is stuff like supervised fine tuning. So you will take completions from another model, maybe top rated human completions. Um, and you will fine tune, you will simply train the model on this and you will get what people commonly turn in instru an instruction tuned model. I would say that here, the language of like instruction tuned, fine tune, it's all over the place. People use whatever they want, so don't feel too attached to it. And the other approach is through reinforcement learning. Um, and when you do reinforcement learning, like in Lama 2, ChatGPT, uh, Claude, um, instead it's a bit different, um, where you will be collecting human rankings uh, of completion and you will use this to train a first model, which will be a reward model, which will say essentially, oh, is this a good completion or not? And then you will use that to train you know, the final model, the policy, uh, with reinforcement learning. Um, reinforcement learning is really powerful. I would uh, bet a lot of money that it's quite a bit more powerful than supervised fine tuning. The problem of reinforcement learning uh, is that it's very hard. The so engineering of reinforcement learning, because you have multiple models that you have at once, uh, is much more difficult, uh, and there is currently no good open code base really for this sort of stuff. So this means that it's not getting adopted by the community, sadly. Um, so for now, this is something that remains in the realm a bit more of like private models, closed models. Um, this is very nice, um, but this doesn't answer the question of performance. Like, which data, if I want to answer a question, like which data should I use? You know, like, I have collected completions from another model. Which one are better to use than the other? What methods work best? You know, supervised fine tuning, reinforcement learning. How to tune my recipe? To answer this question, I need metrics that align with my downstream use. And this is where things go very bad. Um, so here, I do this plot, which is stuff with Falcon 4TB. So you have the pre-trained model, and then you have other models that are, that are fine-tuned. And on the left, I put the accuracy on superglue. Um, choice of superglue is very arbitrary here. You could do this with pretty much anything. And on the bottom, I'm putting like human ratings, which is from zero to five. And what you can see that is kind of fascinating is that you have, for instance, this one, which is done with a very popular uh, recipe, which is Flan. You know, it's like the recipe for multitask fine tuning from Google, um, which has incredible, you know, performance on superglue, but also has garbage human ratings. You don't see it exactly on the plot, but it's actually worse than pre-trained. Um, so in that case, you know, you will think if you look at your basic evaluation, you will be like, oh, this model is great. But no, actually, you should never deploy this to production. Um, and on the opposite, um, you have these models which, you know, improve or not improve. This kind of depends. Um, and which have, like, much higher human ratings, uh, up to the point of actually being on par, more or less, with uh, text DaVinci 3. Um, so essentially, what this means is that there is a fundamental issue of finding tasks that align well with how human perceive, you know, the models. Um, and if you go to, like, leaderboard, because there are a lot of initiatives for leaderboard right now, of big benchmarks, so there is one at Hugging Face, you know, that we have, and you can see, actually, that if you look at the OpenLLM leaderboard, 
So we have a bunch of tasks in it. And actually, if you look at ARC, LSWAG, and MMLU, the scores are all the same between all the five units. They are essentially the same, within a percent or two. It's probably just noise. The only task that changes is truthful QA. And let me tell you, you should look at the content of truthful QA. Truthful QA is not meaningful of how good a model is. And, you know, I'm putting this on spotlight because this is my company, so I can do this without uh, feeling too bad. But I will also put another one on spotlight, <laughs> which is Elm from Stanford, which was recently updated, where at the top of the leaderboard, Tech DaVinci 2 is ahead of Tech DaVinci 3. This makes no sense. I am sure that the people at OpenAI are smart enough not to, you know, make an improvement and not have an actual improvement. And even if you try the models, it's obvious. Um, so what this shows you is that there is a huge issue right now with evaluation. All of the mainstream evaluations are broken. And if they are broken, you cannot iterate. Because performance, pre performance predictability motivates you to scale up. But measuring performance is important so that I can know that I'm not doing crap, you know, that I didn't like miscode something in my code base or that I'm bringing in new data that will help or that kind of stuff. There is a feedback loop. And Maintaining a tight feedback loop is how we make progress. If we cannot measure properly you know, what we are doing, well, then that's it. Like, you know, we are blind men stumbling around in the street. We are never going to find anything. So this is, you know, there is kind of a crisis of, evalu of LLM evaluations. Um, I would say there are a few lessons that you can, uh, pet peeves that I see that I think uh, we could all improve on. Uh, you should never compare a pre-trained model and a fine-tuned model or a pre-trained model and an RL model. This makes no sense. Like, there is no value. People do this. There is no value in comparing a pre-trained model to a fine-tuned model. Yes, a 7B fine-tuned will perform often better than a 40B pre-trained. That's how it is. But a 40B, if you fine-tune it, will be even better. So this makes not a lot of sense. Um, you probably should not be evaluating the fine-tuned or the RL model with NLP tasks. We have seen the leaderboards are completely broken. I think, actually, NLP tasks are quite good for pre-training evaluation. I think right out of pre-training, NLP tasks do capture something about generalization and the general abilities of the model, but this is definitely not true after fine-tuning. After fine-tuning, you are out, you know, you're, you should not do this. Um, now, what you should do, because I'm telling you a lot of not, <laughs> and what should you do? Well, sadly, there is no magical solution. Uh, people are looking a lot right now at model-based evaluation, like asking GPT-4, you know, to rank, or oh, is this better, or is this worse? Um, I think this is promising, but still warrant a lot of doubt right now. Like, I wouldn't feel so confident in this. Um, these evaluations overfit on style, for instance. They overfit on length of the answer. Uh, if you go beyond, like, kind of the classic request, can you help me plan my trip to Bali? Um, yeah, the rankings are not very good. Um, and there is also a huge issue of reproducibility. If, as a community, we start relying on a closed model for all of our evaluations, I think it's a bit messed up. Like, I think it's, like, a bit problematic. And finally, well, what you should do, you should do human-based evaluations. This is very sad because human-based evaluations are very costly and very and longer to iterate uh, on, but they are what you should be doing. Human evaluations are the gold standard. I will say, however, that they are not magical. Uh, humans have a lot of biases. Uh, if you present a human with four completion, he's much more likely to choose the first one or the last one and not the two in the middle. Uh, so there is a lot of stuff like this. Humans are also biased towards lunch, just like the models. Um, yeah. It's very complicated. But right now, this is probably your gold standard if you are developing models. Um, if you want an exciting subject to work on um, that you can work with academic resources, uh, evaluations. Evaluations are so important right now to figure something better, uh, but is far from trivial. And I don't think there is anyone that has a very smart idea yet in, in the literature. So this is the first axis of, of scalability. You know, we, make the we put more compute into the model. The models get better. Um, and we can also, you know, kind of guide our findings by trying to evaluate as best as we can. The second axis of scalability is hardware scalability. So it's putting more and more compute into the model. And this, for this, there is um, an amazing quote from Rich Sutton in The Bitter Lesson, uh, which is that the biggest lesson that can be read from 70 years of AI research is that general methods that leverage computation are ultimately the most effective and by a large margin. This means... The only thing you should care about when you are building an LLM is whether your decisions are scalable or not, whether your architecture scale. Architecture almost never improves downstream performance, or like a language modeling loss. This almost never happens. If you can give me a plot of a scaling law with a new architecture where you have a better scaling coefficient, no one has done this. Like this is essentially, you can look at the literature. No one has succeeded. And there is even discussion over whether a transformer improves over a RNN in terms of scaling coefficient. It probably does, but it's not entirely clear if you run the study. So this is like the only thing that matters 
is whether your architecture, what you are deploying, allows you to better leverage your compute. This is the only thing that matters in our research. I think a lot of people picture research as this idea of like, oh, I'm going to have like this epiphany about an incredible architecture that is going to solve everything. You shouldn't do this. This doesn't happen in practice. Research is like basic puzzle solving, and in ML, puzzle solving is making architectures that scale. Uh, We're talking about the last five years at most, maybe ten, right? There is, but right now, right now, I think we have, right now, I don't think we have much more than this. Right now, and I think on the contrary, we have spent a lot of time focusing on stuff that doesn't matter. And I think we should, like right now, we have a recipe that works, and we should focus all of our efforts on it. Yeah. Ah, so, yes, I say rare epiphany. So we can have one every decade. But we shouldn't focus on this as our daily exercise. Like the daily exercise of an LLM researcher is probably not to find the next big architectural improvement. It's very unlikely, and I think, I mean, you can, but I think you will spend a life of pain, essentially, um, compared to going, you know, the way that currently is working very well. Um, you see this in, you know, you have seen this plot probably compute against publication date. Uh, the doubling time of LLM compute is four to six months. It depends on when you measure it. Right now, you are measuring it a bit closer to shorter because GPT-4 just came out, well, just a few months ago. If you were measuring it just before the release date of GPT-4, you would be closer to six months. Um, an interesting observation here is that open source um, is lagging uh, only one point, like about 1.5 years behind. But thanks to the work on Llama, notably, uh, open source is not getting distance. So I plot like the two trends here. Um, I don't know if it sees very well the, gr the green one and the orange one above. And you can see that open source and closed AI are essentially parallel, more or less. Um, in fact, depending on if you include whether another model on this graph that I have not included, but that may get included soon enough, uh, you may even see it's catching up. But um, essentially, this is, I think, a very interesting thing to see that, you know, open source is still here and gives us access to great, you know, to great resources to do like good research around this. Um, where does this come from, actually? Right? This is interesting. This is, I think, a very interesting question of why are we in this regime of progress for LLMs? Um, if you look at the history, so this is from Epoch AI. They do this very cool thing where we have this database of all of the main ML models trained across time for, like, since 1955. So, you know, it goes back quite a while. Um, and by publication date and compute, um, you essentially have, a, until 2010, like the compute that you see put into models track Moore's law. Um, so, you know, Moore's law, like the doubling of transistor, blah, 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 compute doubles, uh, different interpretation of it. Um, and this is mostly because at the time, you know, ML was kind of like, I won't say a fringe science, but it was not very hype. <laughs> let's, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, and so all that ML researchers had to use was like, you know, mainstream compute. And so they were using that. Um, then you have deep learning, you know, since about 2010, when we started using GPUs where compute doubled every five to six months, much faster than our hardware doubles. And this is because of dedicated accelerators. So here there is something that is super interesting uh, about the fact that a lot of the progress in machine learning is enabled not by like a fundamental improvement in silicon because these improvements are somewhat slowed, but by like specialization of silicon. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of stuff even coming up in the future for future generation of chips like chiplets uh, that are going to continue to enable that. And then there is this other one, which is a large scale era since 2016. Actually, it corresponds to AlphaGo coming up, um, where you have a sudden shift upward. So it's not, I don't know if it's very visible on the graph. The graph is a bit buzzy. But you can see that you have this sudden red trend, which is like above of all of the others. And these are all, you know, like the LLMs, uh, AlphaGo, like all of that. And the doubling time is about the same as the main, you know, deep learning. But suddenly, we shifted upward. And how we did this is because of distributed computing. Essentially, suddenly, and I don't want to say that people didn't do distributed computing in ML before, this is not entirely true, but suddenly we started doing it a lot more. And this unlocked a massive amount of resources. Because instead of being limited to one accelerator, suddenly you could use thousands of them. And this is really, and this is really big. So this also comes with a lot of pain. Um, distributed computing is really fun. Um, and I'm taking here extract from the OPT training logs. They are really good. Um, letting node idle costs $2,500 an hour. This is the learning rate curve of OBT. <laughs> Probably not what you want your learning rate to look like. Um, the CSP, so the cloud service provider, deleted the entire cluster by mistake or unplugged an uh, infinite band cable. I think this has happened to many people in the industry. 
um, waste compute and researcher time. Distributed training is very painful. Like, it's very difficult. It's where all of the difficulty, actually, of a lot of the difficulty of modern LLMs come from. So, this is, you know, one of the biggest subjects. The other, I think, the very exciting subject is about decoupling. Sorry, can you yeah. The ah, yeah. So, um, this is in OPT. So, this is a learning rate uh, across iterations. Essentially, they had to manually tune it because they had, like, blow up in the model sometimes. So, they had to, you know, decrease it manually, like, you know, so this is manual intervention mostly. This is not automated, yeah. Obviously, you don't really want your learning rate to look like this. This is probably not good. Um, I would say that this is also not necessarily illustrative of, I think, nowadays, you know, OPT was a bit of a pathfinder. Um, and they also trained in FP16, which you should never let your friends train in FP16, probably. Uh, it's not, you know, a good idea. Yeah. No, this one, no. This one, I agree. No, no, this one, I completely agree. This one is more of a FP16 decision, and I was But what I mean by that is that a lot of the decisions that you are going to take, because indeed, this one doesn't have to do. I know they had some problem with, um, or it was a later one, was there some problem with a cable getting disconnected or something like that by someone. But um, on this one, it's more of a problem with choosing like numerical precision, you know. So small decisions, like numerical precision, will have a massive impact when you are training this large of models and everything. And you, between FP16 and BF16, you essentially have the same number of bits, but you are just allocating them differently, essentially. And just by doing this, you know, you mess up everything. Like, you completely change uh, the training dynamics. One of the big challenges right now is that this is very fun to spend more money, to have a very large cluster with thousands and thousands of GPUs, but then you have to put this into production. You know, um, one, I think, of the nicest thing about LLMs is that they have actual, you know, world deployments. And we learn so much as scientists from seeing how people use uh, the models. So a lot of stuff like RLHF, you know, reinforcement learning, exists because we see people using the models. And I think this is super cool. So we can't just, you know, go in a scaling frenzy and put so much compute into the model and then tell to the engineers that do the deployment, you know, like, deal with it. Deal with my 540 billion parameter model. Um, What's interesting is that to scale um, training compute, you can do it in multiple ways. So the first way in which you can do it is by increasing the model size. This is not what you want to do. Increasing the model size is nice because if the model size is larger, it's probably easier to distribute it during training. I'm saying this in big, you know, yeah. But, you know, if you have more parameters, you have more computation to do, it's easier to distribute. Uh, it's very easy to make the model bigger. You change a line or two in your config and it's done. Um, the problem is that at inference, you know, you are going to have to pay for that. So this is not the right way. What we have seen a lot um, with like, the scaling law of Chinchilla, of Man, uh, and also with the Lama models, I think the Lama models are actually the ones that have popularized this the most into the, liter into, like, the public, I would say, um, is to train for longer. This is very simple, because when you train for longer, you don't make the model more expensive to run. You make training longer, and you spend more money on training, and you spend more compute on training, you put more abilities into the model, but you don't make the downstream model more expensive to use. So training for longer is another solution. The problem is that by training for longer, uh, and I will come to that in my last section, is like, now you need more data. And this might not be so trivial to do. So um, this is the right way. And another way, which is less popular, but um, starting to gain popularity, is to do stuff like mixture of experts. Um, when you are doing a mixture of experts, only a fraction of the model is active at a time. During training, the entire thing is active. Essentially, during training, you are making it so that you are training all parts at once. So it's essentially equivalent to a larger model. Lovely, you know, it's easier to distribute. But during inference, you are only paying for the active parameters. So you are essentially reducing the cost of inference in some way. This comes with its own challenges. Um, it's not necessarily easy to run inference on a MOE, but uh, this is what also a lot of people are doing right now. This is more in industry. I think you don't see it as much in the literature. Well, there is from a few years ago, but you don't see it as much. But this is coming up for sure. Um, I will skip over this because I'm running a bit out of time. Um, but these are like just some nice decisions you can take um, in terms of like distributed training. Um, so when we train Falcon, we use 3D parallelism and zero. Um, a lot of people use FSDP nowadays. The reason we didn't use FSDP is because 3D parallelism gives you more flexibility when you have cheap infrastructure, uh, which was our case. We train on AWS. AWS is not very well known for its amazing interconnect. Um, but you can actually do quite a bit with it. Um, but for that, you know, you have to dive deep, essentially. 
uh, and that requires you to have more control over how parallelization is done, and mostly that's really parallelism. Then there is a bunch of innovation like flash attention, Triton, uh, what we call the monolayer of merging a lot of computation. All of this is more or less a variant on fusing operations, more or less. Um, this is always good. Uh, in terms of architecture, you know, when I was telling you before, in terms of architecture, focus on like stuff that will bring scalability. Um, I have not seen anyone do anything smart in architectures, uh, even in industry. I think it's mostly just, you know, like stuff like multi-group attention, parallel attention, and fit forward to make the model more scalable for inference. I would say as well that it's very difficult to find better architectures for training in terms of um, efficiency, because training is somewhat of an easy setting uh, compared, to in compared to inference. And a cool feature that we have is that we stream everything from S3. We don't have a distributed file system. If you are into HPC, this is amazing. You know that distributed file systems are absolutely terrible. Uh, one of the benefits we have when we do large language models is that the data, like the data I.O., in terms just of like, you know, like uh, pre-training data and checkpoints, um, is very, like, it's not intense at all. So you can actually get away with a lot of, of stuff, uh, which is nice. So the last angle that I want to talk about is data scalability. You know, we know, okay, the model, we make them bigger, they are better, uh, caveats to how we evaluate. Uh, we know that we can do this thanks to distributed training. This is complicated and doesn't necessarily always go the right way. Uh, but we know it's possible, uh, and we all work a lot on this. Uh, and now there is a question of the data. So this plot, once again, this time I'm plotting, um, and sorry, I inverted the axis. Uh, on my legend, I'm putting the compute in the model and the pre-training data. And I kind of want to attract your attention on two things that all of the models with a square were published before the Chinchilla paper from DeepMind, and all of the models uh, with a slightly rotated square, which I forgot the name of in English, uh, are published after Chinchilla. Um, and what you can see is that before Chinchilla, we were doing this very easy thing of training larger and larger models, but more or less keeping the data set size fixed. And this was not that good of an idea. And so now what we are doing is that essentially we increase jointly model size and data set size. In fact, I would say that nowadays the tendency will be even to go a bit beyond that. Because as I was telling you before, it allows you to decouple inference compute. Um, the problem in this is that you can see I've made this line at about 5 trillion tokens of the clean data available in common crawl. This is an estimate. You can see that we are crossing it. So this has led a lot of people to say, are we running out of data? And I will skip a bit quickly over this. Historically, you know, LLMs have been trained on a mixture of web data and higher quality data, like curated data. This curated data, if you look over the years, um, often there has been a bit less of it sometimes uh, because it's hard. It takes a lot of individual work that is not scalable. And also it has a lot of copyright issues. Right now, you know, there are huge lawsuits around books. Um, and yeah, that's the kind of problem that you get with this data. It's probably good data. But it's an issue. So probably what you want is to only use web data. But web data really sucks. Like if you go, I mean, you can guess that by yourself, but if you go to a common crawl dump and you open an average document on a common crawl dump, firstly, it's very likely to be pornography. And if it's not, it's spam. So it's probably not what you want to train the model on. So one thing we spend a lot of time in Falcon um, is making a data pipeline that gives us like web data that is of quality that is comparable to curated data. And the way we measure this, and I'm taking here the example on a 1B on a 1B model where I'm measuring the aggregate zero shot performance on a bunch of two different aggregates. Um, and here you have different models trained on the pile. All of these models are very similar configuration, but different code base. Uh, you can see that there is still quite a bit of a difference. Uh, this also highlights issue, you know, with like evaluation setup, comparisons. If you want to do a fair comparison, the fairest comparison you can do is probably within your own code base. As soon as you go across code base, you have a lot of issues. Uh, but this is just a small point. And this is the open AI models. Um, evaluated through the API or uh, as given by the evaluation that they give in the paper. And the pile, you know, is this very popular data set that was built by a letter AI, kind of as a reproduction, not quite, of the, of the GPT-3 training data. Um, and this is known, like this was known as like the highest quality curated data in the past. This is not true anymore because now there's a red pie jammer, that kind of stuff. But this was the time when we made this. Um, and you can see the gap is huge. Like you can see that, so a few percent maybe doesn't speak to you immediately on this. But to give you context, uh, I think it's four percent, like it's like three or four percent. It requires you to times four the compute, more or less, to gain it. Like if you compare to like a 3B model or like a 6B model, you will see like you only gain a few percent. So 
This is a massive difference. And it's entirely data-driven, because in these architectures are not that different. And this is the result we get with Refined Web, um, where essentially we match the performance of the OpenAI models um, without using any so-called high-quality data. We only use web data. And this is really to show, you know, oh, you can actually make web data quite good, but it's just a matter of filtering it. And the filtering, it's a lot of steps. So, you know, you have to filter the URLs to remove some stuff that is not safe for work, spam, whatever. Uh, HTML extraction, because what you get out of common crawl um, is an HTML file. They do run all their own extraction, but it's not very good. Uh, then you have to do language identification. Already by, by the time you have done this, uh, only 50% of that is English. Then we have some um, rules-based filtering, where you, know, you have rules on like, oh, there is too many alphanumeric characters in this line. Let's get rid of it. Um, bunch of stuff. By the time you have done your filtering, you have removed another 50% of the data. And then the most important step, uh, large-scale deduplication. Deduplication is the one consistent improvement to large language model. This is the one thing, if you have to bet all of your money on one thing in large language model, it is deduplication. Um, so you run deduplication very large scale. I will skip the fun of deduplication. Uh, this is actually a very interesting computer science problem. There are many ways to run deduplication. Um, this is another cool thing on which I would invite people to work on. Uh, you can make deduplication much more efficient if you, have, like, if you look into computer science. Right now, one thing uh, that I'm very excited from that was uh, tipped uh, to me by someone at LNAI, by Dirk, Dirk from the Olmo project, is to use Bloom filters. Um, and I think this is extremely promising and probably very good. Um, so yeah, so at the time we did minash plus exact substring. And by the end, when you have done all of that, you are left with 10% of the data. So you start with common crawl that is like petabytes after petabytes after petabytes. It's about 100, 150 trillion tokens. And you end up with, for English, you end up with four to five trillion tokens of English that are actually usable. Um, four to five trillion sounds like a lot, but GPT-4 is trained on 14 trillion. On 13 trillion. So, yeah, you are a bit stuck. Um, obviously, common crawl is not perfect. You can, if you run your own crawl, you will get more. Um, you may ask, what about doing multiple epochs? Uh, this is what people, you know, if you have trained a model on MNIST, computer vision, whatever, you probably do a lot of epochs. You rack up the epochs. Well, this doesn't work for causal models um, and for LLMs. Um, it's they are very sensitive to this. There's a bunch of study on this. There's one very cool from Entropic that is a bit underground. I don't know why people don't know this paper too much. Hernandez, they show that there is, uh, you will love this actually, Longa, a double descent phenomenon on uh, data duplication in data sets. It's super cool. Um, and um, yeah, so essentially they show a scaling law on data set duplication where if you have too many, like on large models, as few as a few duplicates, just a few duplicates, could like catastrophically degrade performance. Uh, this is an excellent paper. Um, the setup is a bit questionable in some ways, but, uh, but it's a good first step. So maybe four epochs is safe, but not much more. You know, you take that, you do your own crawl, you do four epochs. Maybe you have 40 trillion tokens, but not much more. This is a huge problem. At the beginning, I was talking about model with 100 trillion tokens. We don't have that in text right now, and maybe we'll never have. So People are looking a lot at multimodality right now. I think there is a big hope that by plugging image into the model and everything, we can, you know, like get the, uh, we can get a gain from this. There is a very good paper from Meta about how this is quite difficult. Um, it's like scaling laws for, uh, multi, uh, like for joint multimodality or something like this, um, where they show that stuff is a bit iffy. You know, it's like it doesn't work so well so far. So there is a lot of work on this. This is a very exciting direction. Everyone is investing unimaginable amount of money in this right now. Um, we we'll guess that a lot of TPUs and GPUs right now are burning towards this sole goal. So, yeah. Um, I want actually, this is funny uh, that Armand, you put this in the previous presentation because I made the same slide. <laughs> and I, I swear it was there before I saw yours. Um, this is all done with small teams. Um, the main bottleneck of large language models is only compute. It's not the human resources. If you have compute, the leverage that you can have is incredible. There is so much to do. Everything remains to be done. This is like an open frontier. There are so many low-hanging fruits. They are infinite. So you can use with a very small team, all you need is compute. That's the main bottleneck right now. Uh, so convince your supervisor to buy <laughs> an H100 cluster to rack up my NVIDIA stock. Uh, but I'm kidding, but yeah, this is like 
All of this can be done with very small team. This is the entirety of the Falcon team, by the way. This is the entirety of it. Like, uh, so, um, and some of these people were not really into LLMs at the beginning. Uh, so you know, we trained them on the go, and it went fine. And just three topics on which I'm very excited. I'm saying this if you want to chat about this during the coffee break or during the lunch break. Uh, democratizing reinforcement learning for open models. I think this is a very big thing. Uh, and especially with AI in the loop, with constitutional AI, to get rid of the need for human annotators. Uh, because this is not scalable. So it goes against the precept of what we want to do. Multimodality, doing better multimodality, going beyond the Flamingo recipe, doing something where you tokenize everything and just throw it into the model and trying to figure out you know, if this works. Everyone is interested in this, so I'm not being very original. And finally, scaling more. I think some people view this as a bit sad. Personally, I think this is very exciting. Um, we have a main avenue to make the models bigger, is to make them bigger, um, to make them better. Um, so yeah, I think like enabling all of this, all of the engineering, all of the work, all of the infra work to do all of this, I think is so exciting. So yeah, that's all. You enjoyed it. Thanks for the amazing talk. We have maybe time for one question, and then we will move to the coffee break. Yes. There was the Pythia paper from Luther that found the opposite conclusion yeah. and investigated this in depth. I was wondering this if you is, had a comment on that. This is a very, very good, uh, this is a very good point. We talk about it actually in our paper on this subject in Refined Web. Um, what we, um, so there's a few things here. Um, first is because a lot of the work on the duplication currently is very quantitative. Essentially, it's like, oh, you know, I do the duplication on web data. And the more I, d I jack up my deduplication, the better performance I get. So essentially, you can find a correlation between like how much you remove and how much better the models get. Um, and this is because a lot of this work is on web data, whereas Pitya is on the pile, which is more like curated data. And one thing that is possible is that why deduplication is so effective on web data is also because in web data, the top duplicate, if you look at the clusters in Minash, for instance, uh, there will be a lot of spam or pornography. So document that you don't want anyway. So actually, it's quite possible that deduplication in web data is strongly correlated to the underlying quality of the documents. And that mostly what you are removing is documents that are very bad. Um, and when you do deduplication on like a higher quality corpora, um, you have less that, you know, because you don't have that as much. We are working on this at the moment, actually. We are working on a paper on this uh, where we are essentially doing synthetic deduplication, like we are faking the structure of duplicates to try to better understand this. Um, and yeah, there is also in Pitya, I think there could, it could be, like there are two things is that I reanalyze the results and actually I find a small signal from the duplication. It's small, but it's there. And I also reproduced with our own code base on the pile and I could get a signal for the duplication. So I think there is also something about the duplication can be very finicky to implement. And there is not that many good open source implementation of the duplication. And even if there is, it's very dependent on your underlying infra. So I think it's also very easy to mess up. I think it's kind of one of the caveats, actually, in modern machine learning, and especially in LLM. This is purely empirical driven. Like, LLMs are, like, completely empirical driven. And this is, I think this is amazing. Personally, uh, I, I think this is why we make so much progress so fast. But it also comes with a caveat that, yes, yeah, sometimes you can make a mistake in your experiments. And this can be very hard to control. Um, so, yeah, kind of in the middle. Maybe it's something about quality being correlated in web data to the duplication. Maybe I think it's possible also that in their setup, they end up with something that's a bit for the duplication, a bit unfavorable. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So we have time for one last question. I was waiting I for just, it. Yes, I just want to go back to your comments about what should be and what should not be done in research. Because you are, in a sense, taking the evidence that there is no better architecture in the literature currently as an evidence that it cannot be done, right? So, but this is, there is an evidence that it can be done, which is in your own head, right? Which is the brain that does it with less compute, with less data, with less, so what was the third yeah. axis? Okay, I don't remember. Yeah. So, so it is clear that by improving the algorithm, the architecture, the data pre-processing, or the way we kind of feed the data, we can change the yeah. scaling laws. So saying that research is pointless on so that is, is just misplaced, to, yeah, yeah. don't you think? You, you, you are right, Langa, and I want, to, I want to put a caveat to this, is that I see this also as a bit of a way to be a bit um, 
um, how to say this. I say this to push people a bit um, because I think this is, there has been a lot of criticism for a while on LLMs being purely a scale-up thing, and this doesn't lead anywhere. Um, for years, you know, LLMs, if you go back to GPT-3 to GPT-2, people were like, oh, this is not, scaling up just blindly is not going to go anywhere. Turns out this is not so much the case. So I kind of say this as a counterpoint to this. Nowadays, I agree with you, this is maybe like beating a dead, a dead rock because people are much more into this line of thought. Now, in terms of finding better architectures, a lot of the reason I say this, and I will say this from a personal experience. Um, obviously, you probably shouldn't take that much advice on me about, uh, about research. I am barely finishing my PhD. I, am, I need to finish writing it, so maybe I'm not you know, the guy you should listen to. From a personal perspective, I can tell you, I have seen a lot of, PA, like I see a lot of PhD students work being pushed, or like even a lot of senior researchers working very hard on trying to find a moonshot, and then, you know, like after years, just burning out because they could not find that moonshot. And this is like, and these people are very smart. These people are excellent. You know, your inability to find a moonshot doesn't mean you are bad. The moonshot is pure luck. It is luck. Like there is, all of research is luck. It's eventually you stumble into the right thing. Magically, you have the magic epiphany. You stumble into the right thing. It's luck. And I'm, I don't like pushing people to luck to something that's a bit luck driven. I think it can be fine if you can withstand it. You know, I think people have made cars in this and can be very good. But I think there is also another axis of approaching very systematically and very like in a more like puzzle solving manner. Uh, and I'm using puzzle solving very intently. Um, of solving these small problems, which might seem sometimes like more engineering problems, but which actually lead also to outcomes. And I think this is a way to, to do things that can, you know, can make you maybe happier in a way, that's like a more certain path towards systematic success. But you are right that um, some people need to do the moonshots. If no one does the moonshot, you know, we'll get nowhere as a field. So it's also, you know, it's built on the sacrifice of the people doing the moonshot while others are doing the fun training on 10,000 GPU stuff. Yeah.